Good morning, friends. And this morning we have something different. Uh, friend Judy is not here at the moment, but she will join us eventually, hopefully. Uh, this talk is going to be on the uses of yoga, something I have no knowledge about whatsoever. Friends. I think Mary's going to start us off, aren't you? More, morning, friends. I think Susie has uh, entitled it The Philosophy of Yoga. Ah. She's got a lot to teach us. Firstly, I'll introduce you to, uh, to Susie. That's Susie taking a class in the top level of the Lido in Porter's Head. You can see Sugarloaf Bay and the yeah. bit of the school. Good, good outdoor activity in there. <laughs> We've all heard about yoga, but Susie will explain that it isn't about trying to put your left big toe behind your right ear. She will talk about the origins and the practices, and she hopes very much that the six of us, maybe more, seven, will join in a discussion. So maybe my prattle will stimulate your thoughts as to what you would like to discuss. During meeting for worship, have you ever paid attention to your own posture and that of those around you? Have you noticed a friend with his arms crossed defensively over his body or his legs skewed around or fists clenched, fingers fiddling, heavy breathing, maybe not that. <laughs> the point is if we want energy to flow and I think in a meeting for worship we do, we do, it's essential to flow between us and into us and out of us. And I think Susie might show us breathing techniques which will help us settle down. And I don't know how many of you have been in a deeply gathered meeting. It, it's a very profound experience. It doesn't often happen in my, to my knowledge. But I, I do feel the way we present ourselves means that either we can ease more easily give out and receive. So my only experience of yoga is Hatha yoga, which is spelled H-A-T-H-A, -H -A, and I believe means sun and moon. And that focuses on the poses, which are called asanas. And I even had the temerity to lead a class when I lived in the Middle East. Otherwise, I've been in large classes, small classes, individual tuition, but I've never done Zoga online. So what I hope that the seven of us will do, will share your thoughts and experiences so that when Susie comes, we can really set off at half past 11. So if you'd like to raise your physical hand or your digital hand, off we go. Ray. I worked for quite a number of years with the Children and Young People's Group. And during yearly meeting, I remember a couple of times, uh, one which was, um, I asked, you know, do you notice to the to the young people? I said, do you notice the other people in meeting, what they are doing, how they are sitting, and all this lot? And we had a very, you know, it was at least twenty minute discussion, which is good for for a young of that age on how, <coughs> pardon me, how people behaved. And they drew people and, you know, and they were very observant, you know, of how people were sitting, as you said, you know, how people were 
were occasionally breathing through the old, older ones done that you know and, and mm -hmm. you know they seem to observe that quite well mm -hmm. and another time we uh and i think i don't know if all friends have been to um uh, friend's house in in london but they have there a balcony around the top and so when meeting was get, when meeting was going at some one time, I took a lot of the young people up there and, and explained they had to be very quiet. But they went up there and they observed meeting from above. And the remarkable thing was, it's the young people saying, you know, how quiet it was and how strange ways people were sitting you know, to, to be comfortable and to be relaxed, some were more relaxed than others, you know, and mm -hmm. that was it, the remarkable thing about it, you know, the, 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 the kind of ways that people relaxed, and I'm sure some of them, I think some of them must have been practicing some kind of meditation because we were all most impressed, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, it fueled another discussion with that with uh with a few parents who came when they came later to collect the children um told me that when they went back to their their parents you know a discussion ha was had by the by the child children and the parents of of how 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 these type of things happened and the parents being quite impressed so mm. yeah it just doesn't happen to adults but children as well it reminds me of two things one is the story of a little boy turning him to his mother during meeting for worship and saying mummy are they all dead <laughs> and another um, remembrance is a yearly meeting with two thousand people all jabbering and jabbering, as soon as the clerk put one foot into that hall, there was an instant silence. It was absolutely profound. Hello, Mary, can you see me? Yeah. Yes, carry on, friend. Yeah, hello, this is Julia. I'm sorry I haven't been to meet to, to your discussions for a long time. But I'm terribly interested about all of this. And But what interests me most, in a way, is that it's never occurred to me, all the times I've been in meeting, that I should be thinking about what, how people were sitting or anything to do with what they were doing. Because, to me, the important thing was to think about the the inside of them and how they're, how they're thinking, how they're reacting how they're coping with life and all the rest of it. It doesn't really occur to me that I should be thinking about um, their outer bodies and what they were doing. So, and in particular, I'd like to ask Mary, um, do you, what do you call the chakras? Is there something slightly different, the, the chakras, which I understand as nine different um, parts of your body, which all relate to different body, different parts of your senses. Are you still with us, Mary? Yes, I'm sorry. It was sorry. Before, needless to say an Amazon parcel. Yes, I'm here. Could you hear what I was saying? Um, Julia, do, do you want to say, to say it again? Is that all right? Yes, okay. Um, what I wanted to say was that uh, um, it's never occurred to me all the times I've been in meeting, which is kind of all my life up to a point, in a way, it never occurred to me to think about the outside of how people were sitting. It, I've always thought the important thing was to think about the interior about them and how they were feeling, how they were behaving, how they were coping with everything. So um, can you hear me right now, Mary? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. And, um, 
And so it's interesting to try and think of the outside of their bodies and how they were sitting and stuff as well. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you about chakras. So how does that compare with um, with um, with what what you call it hatha hatha you you, you call it too? Well, that's those those are the poses. The chakras are the five points, aren't they, in the body? But ask Susie when she comes. <laughs> I will. No, there's more than five, there's seven, I think. I think there's seven. All oh, right, I've lost two somewhere. Okay, Graham, I, I'm going to play chair in the momentary absence of Ray. Would you want to go ahead next? I, <laughs> my experience of Hatha Yoga is. Uh, on the whole good and I wish I had practiced it more. So far as meeting is concerned, yes, I am always, I think, conscious of my own posture. I hardly ever think about what other people are doing and that it is um, a bit exceptional, like the young man at uh, Bedminster who used to lie on his back on the floor uh, while everybody else was was seated, that was a bit unusual. Hello, hello. Could you drop my notice? Can you turn up the volume at all? We're all having trouble slightly oh. to hear. Um, hang on. I'll go closer to the uh, microphone. That's oh. that's the easiest thing. So far as my myself is concerned, always sit to the back of the seat, not forward. And the principle I think I follow is don't cross anything, arms or legs, and and concentrate on on initially on breathing. My experience of um, hatha yoga started in India thirty years ago, when I was staying with a group of Indian students who were trying to teach me in their technique the technique of the one who was speaking was to take each toe each finger and thumb and every day rotate it five times clockwise and five times anti-clockwise and i was surprised at this and now in old age while well, the smaller toes on both feet cling to each other <laughs> uh, with great force. I wonder what difference it would have made had I practiced this um, <laughs> routine every day since I first uh, was told about it. I do occasionally now try to uh, extend and stretch my, my joints in the hope of keeping reasonably flexible. And I have attended at the Gandhi Foundation summer gathering uh, numerous classes. There's only for one week a year uh, in uh, the the various demanding asanas that uh, you, Mary, have experienced as well. I'm turning my fingers, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a really good idea. Um, I mean, it took me an awfully long time simply to keep still. I mean, totally, you know, I, 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 I used to find it really hard. Um, I, I don't mean I wanted to jump around, but, you know, um, I don't know, flexing bits of my body and stuff. And, and, oh, and, and then about halfway through, um, oh, I don't know, lo losing concentration altogether, really, and looking out of the window and... Um, learning to focus all over again I mean it, it was it was around about then that it occurred to me how useful it would have been to have done some work with yoga simply to teach myself stillness um and um but I've not done it <laughs> did you think sitting with your hands open in your lap to me, that signifies giving and, mm. and also having your hands free to receive. 
Yeah, it's a very good idea. I don't do it much either. Mm. The only reason I don't do it, I might just chip in again, is that uh, because my my left hand had we I had a stroke, and therefore I have to if I don't hold it steady, it it tends to waggle waggle about. So I have to um, keep it steady with my other hands. Mm. I, do, I, do you have to? Well, it's interesting. I don't always know. And if I think of, if I can kind of concentrate and stop doing, stopping it from doing it, but it tends to work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite hard, it can waggle. So. So what kind of questions might, might we fire at Susie? Well, firstly, is, is she a Quaker herself or? No, no, she's not, no. She's just not just. She's a well-known teacher in Portishead and locally. In fact, both Judith and I know her, don't we, Judith? Yes. In, interestingly, she is the daughter of a vicar, but I don't think she practices anything religious. Mm -mm. You've got a little um, model behind you on your bookshelves, haven't you? Oh, the Buddha? Yeah. Yes, because I had 10 years of practising meditation where everybody was completely still. So when I came to the meeting and people were reading and shuffling, I was quite surprised. Um, yes, it's a different sort of thing from sitting completely still meditating. Yes, I, I remember I was absolutely astounded um, quite early on by a, a, someone who came to a meeting and lay on the floor. <laughs> um, <laughs> from a mildly Methodist background, you know. <laughs> I was, it hadn't occurred to me that it, it wasn't that I didn't think one could um, worship on the floor. It, it was just that I was a bit startled. I didn't realize people might do it in a meeting. Um, so that I mean, was good for me, actually. It uh, made me think, which is never a bad thing. I've done that when my husband was dying and I went to Quaker meetings because um, mm. it seemed the right thing to do. And it was just mm. like, do people find animals an intrusion, the sort of licking dog and things? Yes. <laughs> well, the only dog I've got experience of is very good and just lies down and goes to sleep very, very happily. Mm. That one's fine, but thinking yeah. about it wouldn't be good. Yeah, I think it depends on the behaviour of, of the dog. Because um, my, my last dog I did used to bring to meeting and I would lay her special mat and she would lay on the mat and that would be it, you know. But um, the dog I have now, I'm not too sure that that would work. <laughs> so, I don't know. Occasionally they minister, don't they, with a sort of woof? Well, she didn't do that, no. <laughs> the talking. You're talking about uh, meditation just now, Judith, you know, mm -hmm. and I used to meditate with a couple of friends. Mm -hmm. And when I left London to do other things, a one dear old friend presented me with this, which is a kind of... Yeah. Oh. Little, little yeah. Buddha. Yeah. It's a little, yeah. little, a little uh, spelter. Buddha figure yes. but it's sitting in the lotus position and uh, and I was enormously touched so mm -hmm. when, whenever when when I produce when I do my meditations now you know this this little chap is always somewhere near me so I can mm -hmm. actually look at him you know it's yes it's just yeah. lovely it's, it's a mm -hmm. focus piece as you probably as friends mm -hmm. will know you know occasionally you need a focus piece to mm -hmm. to settle upon <laughs> that reminds me, my, my husband, who uh, very, very rarely swore, went to yoga classes, and one day he came back 
really in quite a bad temper. And he said, next week, we've got to bring a blank, blank, blank candle. <laughs> <laughs> we've been talking about using the word meditation a lot. Um, is that not what we're trying to do in meeting? You wanted to say something, Harry? Harry, I can't hear you, of course. Are you muted? No, oh. for some, some reason, her, her system, the sound is gone. <laughs> mine? Chat? Sorry, my system or whose? Harriet's. Oh, Harriet, right. Are you putting anything in chat, Harriet? Doing it now. There you go. I was programmed by the shop this week, still no volume. Oh. <clears throat> How sad. Mm. Um, I've never uh, ever practiced yoga, but um, an older friend um, swore by it, and I was just curious to know <laughs> the experience. Um, how quickly um, you start to feel the benefit in terms of being slightly more limbered up and um, able to move with greater ease and, and things like that. Because um, I think if I tried to get to the floor now, um, I'm, you know, so unfit uh, that it would be on hands and knees and I'd need a chair to help me get back up again. And so on. That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm just curious because it seems to me there is the that sort of physical benefit of yoga, of you know stretching and easing and and you know releasing um and then also the the kind of psychological and if i could say spiritual uh, element of it as well the calmness and mm. so on so yeah i'd be interested to hear people's experience of what it was like to start off and then where you feel you're at now when i first started yoga it I thought every bone in my body was going to break. It felt terrible. Um, but as the years have gone on, I really couldn't do without it. I think it does help to keep me flexible. Yeah. Thanks. And alive. Yes. Well, I, I, I've recently had this new hip and recovery is going extremely slowly. But I'm just terrified of doing anything a bit different. You, you well, know. Ask, ask Susie when she comes. Yeah, I'm just being yeah. really cautious. But I, I can I can hear from what people say that it would be an excellent thing to be doing. Uh, it, would, it would help. Hopefully, the good uh, the friendship uh, they they uh, Susie should be with us very soon, and we will. Graham, as you lived in a country where yoga originated, can you tell us more of that experience? Is he there? Yep. Yes, I'm. I'm here. Um, the thing I noticed was that Indian women, some of them quite elderly, oh. change from walking to sitting on the floor with yeah. a grace and a fluency which mm. you don't see in this country. Mm. They didn't sit on chairs, of course, they sat on the floor. Mm. That movement from walking along to suddenly sitting on the ground effortlessly uh, was quite impressive. Whether that was due to inherited genes 
or the practice of yoga, I don't know, but it was noticeable. I didn't notice it with the men, actually. When I lived in the Middle East, it was prevalent throughout. I mean, you'd have, for instance, in an outpatient clinic, people walk in, stand up beautifully, and in a second have just sunk yeah. to the ground. And as you say, any age, yeah. any age. Mm -hmm. that, that is fascinating, isn't it? You know, yeah. Sorry, so I just, just stepped on the dog I was referring to just now. <laughs> She's on, she gets as close as possible. Which in, uh, is under the table. Well, that's where I put my feet. You see. So, anyway, yes, it, it's it's beautiful to watch. You know, when you see it on, on in a film or something, and um, I think, oh, if I could only do that. <laughs> I'd like to ask Ray whether his Buddha helps him to get into the lotus position. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do lotus position, but now the um, I my knees have both gone. So actually, uh, crossing I can cross the right over the left, but the other way and kneeling down is an impossible task, unfortunately. So uh, 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 the the Buddha is more of a mental aid rather than a physical aid, I'm afraid, these days. <laughs> we have Susie now with us. Yes, good morning. Hello. Hello. Sorry you had to wait for me. That's okay. No, it's, we, yes. I'll pass, you, I'll pass over to, to Mary, who will no doubt give a better introduction than I. Okay, thank you. <laughs> right, here's the better introduction. We're delighted, delighted to have you, Susie. And uh, I think we're going to be brim full of questions when you've finished your talk. Do far away. Absolutely, yeah. Far away with any questions whenever, because um, I do tend to witter on quite a lot. Um, I've got lots of information. And um, the subject for today's talk really is the philosophy of yoga which is a lifetime of study, um, um, many lifetimes probably. Um, so I'm giving you a very, very brief, um, almost a bird's eye view of the tip of the iceberg. Um, and um, there's lots more if you want it. Um, my name is Susie Griffin. I'm a yoga teacher, yoga therapist in Portishead area. I teach yoga classes. I teach one-to-one um, -one people for therapy or development. Um, I uh, also I'm a, I'm a counsellor or um, I use my counselling skills within my yoga context so I use a yoga philosophy to aid people's way of seeing their life and any problems they may feel that they have um, with a new light with a new kind of torch to shine a new mirror to use to, to shine up and, and, and reflect back um, and the yoga philosophy has been really useful to do this. So this is um, ancient teaching, and um, many people think that yoga is all about how you can move your body and how you can look really great in lycra. <laughs> and uh, this isn't something that I um, adhere to. And I, um, I often say to people, you know, yoga is not all about being able to get your um, ankle over your earlobe, um, which is a posture I can't do. Um, it's, it's more about a, a way of being. Um, and um, people might look at me a bit quizzically when I say that, but um, I'll hopefully um, you'll have a little bit more of an understanding about what that means um, by the time I finish this little, little chat. Um, so uh, any more introductions? Um, just the introduction to the word yoga, really. Um, yoga um, is, has many, many, many me meanings. But if we go right back to when it was first used, possibly about 2000 years ago, um, we are looking at a word that it has the meaning of the ancient word of yoke. Um, so the yoke, if you imagine two oxen 
like wanted to move in different directions around the field are completely, um, you know, without any control. But if you yoke them together, then you've got two oxen going in the same way, plowing the same furrow. Um, and this is basically what we're trying to do with yoga. We're trying to link two almost disparate things together in order to be able to achieve something in life, in, um, in our bodies maybe, in our uh, aims and objectives, whatever we might choose. And it's about what we do and what we might link, what we might want to link towards. So we might want to link towards a certain aim that we have in life. Um, say for example, uh, like a, a, a spiritual connection that we might be aiming towards, or we might be wanting to link to aim to get our ankle over our earlobe, whatever, whatever it might be. But there is a relationship between myself and whatever I link towards. And this relationship is about two separate things with, with an objective of joining these things together and still keeping them separate. So it's not a, a, a jumbled you know, a web of, or a tangle of, of you know, wall. It, it is about keeping these things separate. And a space between these things being open. And we may also realize that sometimes the relationship between the two things, um, you know, we often have relationships, well, we may have relationships in our, in our lives where things can get a bit tangled. And the space between me and the other can become a little bit full of baggage or experience or expectations or you know, society. And yoga can help us open these things again. It can help these things become a little bit more separate, a little bit more spacious. Any questions so far? I thought that what I might do as a way of kind of presenting this is um, talk a little bit about um, some of the, it's about eight different, um, I'm going to call them verses, but they're called sutras, which is a, a, a ancient word for a sutra, like a like a, a weave or a web, oh, a way, oh, a, a thread, um, and we're threading these um, sort of these experiences and these subjects together um, through something called the the Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And this is something that, um, as yoga teachers, as yoga students, we um, we often maybe not aware of, but we should be, um, or um, we are aware of, but just in a very kind of um, very loose and um, very unknowledgeable way. But you know, it's fine. But it's a text there, um, written possibly two thousand years ago, possibly by one great sage known as Patanjali, possibly by more. We don't really know that much about it. Um, and where it actually comes from. But um, luckily it's been saved for our, um, our delights and our experiences and our, and our knowledge. And there's hundreds of thousands of different translations of these yoga sutras, which were originally written in Sanskrit, um, an ancient language no longer used, but often studied um, through ancient scholars of, of this kind of um, theories. There's four different chapters within the Yoga Sutras. The yoga chapters that um, I particularly are interested in or am interested in is chapter two, which seems like a bit of a leap forward into why am I, why am I not interested in chapter one? Chapter one is said to be for those who are already aware and um, have a, a, link, a spiritual link and who are already very experienced in being able to open up a, um, an awareness about um, what the mind is doing and how the mind can be connected to that which is greater than oneself, which is the aim of yoga. We want uh, yoga aimed to open up that connectivity between that which is greater. And for all of us, that might feel like something different. For some of us, it means that which is inside, a spiritual connection to a soul or, a, or a, a deep, spacious clarity or awareness. And for some of us, it might be that which is greater than ourselves, which is something 
spiritual connection with maybe a godhead, maybe mother nature. It might be something more like the universe or some energy uh, moving through the universe. But anyway, there's something greater than ourselves. And yoga is really about the relationship, as I mentioned to start with, about us, between us and that connection. So I'm leaping forward away from chapter one because most of us in the everyday world have no experience about what that connection can be like when we have life getting in the way. Most of us are still students of this and, and need to um, be very mindful about how we live life in the world and about how we can use our tools as a way of aiming towards that connectivity with uh, a greater spirit. One way we can do this is use what's known as the eight limbs of yoga. Now, this is a phrase that's often kind of banded around in yoga circles, eight limbs of yoga. Um, in Sanskrit, it called, it's called Ashtanga yoga, um, not to be confused with Ashtanga Vinyasa yoga, which is something completely different, which is about um, uh, moving very powerfully um, in extraordinary postures with the body. I won't be asking you to do that, don't worry. Um, I'm just going to discuss um, a, a little brief introduction to what the eight limbs of yoga are. And it might surprise you when you realize that um, often what we think of as yoga, the way of standing, sitting, tying ourselves into knots, isn't all of it at all, but it is important. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. So um, briefly, the eight limbs of, of yoga are what's known as, I'll do my hands, but we have the yamas and the niyamas, which are two, two of the limbs. There's five of each, sometimes known as the 10 commandments of yoga, but though I think that's wrongly um, interpreted. Then we have what we do with the body. Um, you might know, recognize the word asana. So the asanas in yoga are seen to be yoga postures. Then we have what we do with the breath and how the breath uh, moves through the body. It's, a, it's an amazing science how we use the breath and how it affects how we are emotionally, spiritually, um, mentally. Then we have something known as pratyahara, which basically means the uh, removal of the distraction of the senses that are brought to us by the world and how these things can, can be a great distraction and take us away from our spiritual connection. The last three of the eight limbs are three different sorts of levels of meditation and deepening our connection to that which is greater than ourselves. So I'd like to start with the yamas. There's five of them, as I say, and these five are um, a lifetime, another lifetime of study. There's one sutra, just one verse where Patanjali, if it was Patanjali, lists five different ways of being in the world and our relationships that we have in the world and how we can keep those relationships free and open and without darkness or entanglement or complexities. Very difficult, I hear you say. Yes, it is. Um, and you'll find that when I'm speaking that a lot of these things are connected with other um, great traditions of spirituality in the world and, and how these, what's known as Ten Commandments or, or injunctions or um, invitations are reflected in all sorts of other um, spiritual traditions. The first of the niyamas, sorry, the first of the yamas is known as ahimsa. This means without violence. So himsa means violence, a in front of a Sanskrit word is against, so not violent. And many of us think, well, in, you know, in the way that we live in the world, actually, for most of us, no violence is quite easy. You know, we wouldn't dream of beating somebody up in the street. You know, what a ridiculous notion. And of course we wouldn't, most of us. But when you think of violence being on, on a many level connection or a many level context, some of us, the idea of doing no harm 
can be a very much more complex idea. Doing no harm. And in the yoga connection, and, and obviously in other spiritual connections as well, uh, doing no harm can be about how we connect with other people around us. So it might be in the way that we behave towards them physically. It might be in the way that we talk to them or even act in our, um, our postures, our bodily postures around them. Because, you know, if we're very, um, even just doing that can be an aggressive stance, can't it? But, you know, if we're open and, and our bodily posture is more comfortable, then that eases any sense of being a, a discomfort opening, a harming the others, the, uh, harming the others' environment that they're living in. Even the way that we talk to people, you know, the way that you say, um, maybe just the word, you know, hello, or hello, you know, even, you know, just the way that we talk, or the way that we think about others. The harm that we can do when we think, it might show on our faces, it might not. But if we, if, even if we, in the Yoga Sutra, it's telling us that even the way that we think about others is really important. And if we have harmful thoughts against another, it still does damage. And it damages the space between us. And my teaching, the um, I'm going to, I, I'm using this, this book that I'm studying at the moment, is embodying the, the Yoga Sutra. Um, my two teachers, Dave and Ranju, um, they wrote the book and I'm, um, it's a really a good way of modernizing, modernizing and making it more of a life experience, these, these ancient yoga sutras. Um, if you want any book references, um, do let me know another time. But um, they are um, reminding us that the, the word ahimsa is really about keeping the space open between you and another and keeping that space where another person can live without fear. They can be who they are. They can be authentic. And they can feel that they're in a space where they're not feeling judged or you know, objectified or you know, whatever it might be, or harmed in any way. They can be free to be. And if we think about the relationships we have in the world, that on its own, can be a difficult thing. But then when we see that Ahimsa is almost the mother of all of the other values that we have, you know, the way that we live in the world, if we live in a way that's non-harming, it can really be a good start, start, starting point. I'm going to have to fly through these now. I can see, um, I you know, it's a favourite subject. So um, do stop me if I if I ramble. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to talk next about the next one, which is um, Satya. I'm just keeping myself abreast of things by referring to my to my book here. Um, but Satya is about truthfulness, and it's about how we can speak the truth. And sometimes it's quite easy to think, well, I shouldn't lie. And we're taught as children, most of us, that lying is a bad thing. But, you know, it, as with all of these yoga things, it's a very complex thing. And how we are able to speak the truth can be much more difficult than first appears. <laughs> The, there's a, an, I don't know if any of you have come across the Mahabharata or the Bhagavad Gita, the um, sort of a very ancient text of uh, spiritual story. The, um, the words in, in the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita are um, reflected in many of the Yoga Sutra, um, but I just want to um, talk um, about one of these reflections. And Mahabharata says, speak the truth which is pleasant. Do not speak unpleasant truths. Do not lie, even if the lies are pleasing to the ear. So this is what it, it means to, to live a truthful life. It's not, it's not only about not lying, it's about being able to speak the truth and to be quiet when we need to be quiet. 
If we can't say the truth, if we can't say, um, oh, I don't know, oh, that's a nice haircut that you've just had from the hairdresser. And actually, it's not a very nice haircut at all. Sometimes it's better to be quiet. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? In, in counselling, and a lot of these, these, um, these ancient thinkings or ancient um, philosophies are brought right up into the counselling philosophy or the counselling context. And um, in counselling, we talk about um, appropriate transparency. So in other words, we are able to appropriately be transparent at the right time with the right person in the right environment. And all of these things can be a very difficult and often take a little bit of space. So we take a space to breathe, to think, and to judge whether what we're just about to say is the right utterance to make at the right time to the person in front of us. The next one is known as brahmacharya often translated um, in a kind of a misguided way as moderation in all things, um, particularly, particularly sexual moderation. But actually, that um, it, it, it's a, a mistranslation. In, in my teaching, it's really about being able to live appropriately and use things appropriately in any way, use things in moderation. So all of the things that we need in our life can either be overdone, underdone, or used in moderation. And if we become obsessive about things, if we become obsessive about, oh, I don't know, even doing yoga too much, for example, that's not brahmacharya, that's not moderation. And it can, it can, it can overwhelm us it can make us feel obsessive. And in the obsession, the relationship between me and the yoga, for example, can become too complex. And it can become um, at odds with everything else going on in my life. And so I, I can lose perspective if I've become un, you know, overwhelmed by something. I can lose my perspective of a light touch of the, um, the goal that I have. So everything in moderation is okay. And it's also when we're thinking about a relationship, it's thinking about not taking everything from one relationship, everything that we feel that we need from one person or one book or one way of being or one bottle of alcohol or one whatever we are able to know that there needs to be a space between us and the thing that we have a relationship with. And we, we don't take advantage of it. We see it as an independent thing. And we, um, we open up the connection that we have with it and, and with a light touch and not grasping hold of that thing in order to make it um, more open, more spacious, more reverent, if you like. So we, you know, we consider that space. The next yoga um, way of being in the world is about asteya. Asteya means literally, the steya means stealing. A means not, not stealing. And again, you know, in, the, in our society, we're thinking, well, that's easy. I don't steal stuff. I don't you know, pinch or half inch from supermarkets for, for other people. I don't, I don't wear a mask and have a swag bag. That's all right. I can do that. But actually, can we? Can we do we find it that easy to astaya? So if we're thinking about our relationships with other people. How can we not steal from another all the time? So can we not steal their ideas? Can we not steal their time? Can we not steal the words that they use? Can we not steal the, um, the, the space that they're allowing us to share with them? Can we not steal their body space? And again, it, it feels 
much more complex when we're thinking about how we can steal from another. And when we do start to pick what we want from another and take what we feel is useful to us, then and we hold on to it, then it takes something away from the other. And, it, and the other's space, the other's way of being is harmed, is complicated. Mm. Are we with me so far? Mm. So the final one of the yamas is called aparigraha. And this means about not grasping. So it's different from stealing. So we can think, well, I don't steal anything. That's fine. I don't steal my stuff from my relationships and the objects that other people have. But what do we grasp hold of? And it's not about stealing that thing. We might have had it in a very, you know, okay way. We might have earned that thing that we've, we've got now. We might have earned all of our belongings. We might have earned all of our relationships. We might have earned all of the money that we've ever earned. That's absolutely fine. But what happens when we start to grasp? That's mine. You know, you know children in playgrounds when they think that's my toy and you're not having it and the, the little fight ensues. Well, we can do this in a much more of a kind of a light way, can't we? We can say, well, um, I've earned all of this stuff. It's mine and you're not having it because I, it, it, I earned it. It was all my hard work that I put into making that thing mine. Mm -hmm. And we might think this, that it's okay to declutter and to take, um, get rid of the stuff around our, our um, rooms, but actually um, these things can be quite difficult. So if we think about relationships that we have in the world, for example, so for example, my relationship with my children, at the moment, for me personally, my children are thinking about leaving home. It's a very hard thing for a mother to think about their children leaving home because, you know, I love my children and I love the space that we share together and I like my relationship with them. So, you know, my temptation is to hold on to them and not let them go. I love you so much. But when I can let them know that they've got the roots in my home, but I can let them be free, then that love I have for them is freer and the relationship that I have with them is more open and they can come back when they want. It's going to be hard to take that separation, but without holding on, without grasping them to me, then I'm opening up us as individuals with a freer relationship between us. I see that I'm going to have to rush through the rest of this um, so um, I'm going to, uh, I've looked at the, the yama, so this is just the five interpretations of how we are in the world with our relationships with others. The next five about how we have a relationship with ourselves, and um, again this can be something that can be quite difficult to do, but we're looking at five of these. We're looking at the niyama being um, freeing us from an unhelpful habits that we have that can kind of hold us and, and, and make us unfree. And these um, are saucha, which is about being clean, um, not necessarily in the body, but also in the mind, you know, detoxifying ourselves of, of things that hold us heavy inside experiences or things that you know we imbibe or um, relationships that we have people that are, are around us and we're looking at self-care essentially by keeping ourselves clean in all its ways samtosha the next one is about contentment and how we can be contented in the life that we lead and it's it's about being free from desire and free from um, not about happiness and unhappiness, but it's about how we can be in this space, no matter where we are, no matter what's happening in our life, being contented in all of that. The next three yama are together, studied in other parts of the Yoga Sutra, but they are about 
tapas, which you might think of some sort of Spanish hors d'oeuvre, but actually um, it's really about how um, we can be discerning and have a um, working on the, uh, the way that we can clear ourselves out and empower ourselves in order to be able to um, move on to the next stage. And we have to go through some tough stuff to do that, um, to, uh, to, to move forward, to make decisions and, and to let those decisions happen. The next is about self-knowing. So how can we know ourselves more deeply? The Yoga Sutras originally would have said, we need to do some study. We need to either study ourselves or use ancient, such as the Sutras or the Bible or you know, whatever ancient text that you can refer to as a mirror to hold up against ourselves and go, oh yeah, I need to work on that or that's what I'm doing and I haven't thought about it that before. So learning about ourselves, um, and, and the way that we might be able to change in a way that's positive. And the last is known as Ishvara Pranidhana, which is a wonderful way of opening up a relationship with that which is greater. Ishvara being the greatest, um, the highest wealth, the highest goodness, whatever that is, whatever that means to us personally. Opening up that relationship doing our best with what we have in our world and then saying, okay, now I can let go. Now I can let something else take over and help me and support me. So that's a quick rush through for the first um, yamas and niyamas. And then I could go on quite some time about the next five of the yoga um, eight limbs, which are just a reminder of what we do with our bodies, what we do with our breath, how we can be distracted by the, what the information, the sense is given, giving us and, and try not to let that be too much of a distraction. And the three different levels of um, connecting with our own awareness and, uh, and how we can move through those different levels in order to be able to free ourselves to really open some clear space to be able to have a relationship with that which is greater. I'm sorry if I've talked fast and um, hopefully not too garbled. I hope I've make, made sense. Um, if you want to know any more, then please ask questions. But do know that I'm here as a yoga teacher to talk on a one-to-one -one basis or in a classroom situation um, with, um, with yoga um, postures or with any other aspect of yoga that interests you. That was a brilliant presentation, Susie. Spellbinding and thought provoking and questioning, I hope. So friends, please ask Susie anything that comes to mind. Julia, Julia you're on mute. If you want, you've got your hand up, Julia, if you've got, um, you, you need to turn yourself off mute. Thank you. The most interesting, as you say, but. To me, my first reaction is an awful lot of thinking about yourself rather than thinking about other people. But it's, it, it's all very interesting. And I'm sure you will disagree because you'll say by being balanced in your own mind, you can help more with being a good relationship with other people. But I don't know. It's an awful lot to think about. But um, And then I particularly wanted to ask about chakras, how they fit into all of this. Is this a different, slightly different form of yoga or...? There's seven chakras, right? Oh, uh, that's a very complex thing. And some that, so again, another um, oh, lifetime of, of study of the chakras. Um, they don't come from the Yoga Sutras. They are something different, but um, it's, it's something that I do use in my yoga teaching. Um, the chakras, um, depending on what spiritual um, theories you come from, um, there can be five or seven or nine, um, any number. Um, and um, they are basically about uh, symbolic representations of places within the body to help us understand how we are in those particular places. Interestingly, they really join in with physical 
medical, well-known, what's known as the, um, the nerve ganglia within the body, uh, and they're very kind of um, important places biologically, but they can be very important places spiritually as well. Um, it's a very personal thing, working on our own chakras. Um, and I get what you say about um, it becoming very personal, these yamas and niyamas, um, and all of the other things um, within our yoga context. But the way I'm, um, I'm taught, um, not all of the traditions believes this, but it's about, um, rather than it being about me and everyone else from the center of me, what it is is about, there's me, there is, a spaciousness and there is the other and so within these two things a relationship can open up so it's not just about how I am although you know this is all I really know um, and my relationship with the other is opened and freer if we have this space and so it does me my space affects the other person's space, their space affects my space. Yeah. So um, if we can keep that um, in a way, very, well, I keep on using the word open, but that's all good, spacious, um, to, to um, make it as uncomplicated as possible. Very interesting. Thank you. I hope that helps, Julia. Yes, yeah, very good. Do, do um, I'll, if you need my email address or if you want to talk to me um, online, uh, absolutely. Normally, do you know someone called Emma Roy who lives in books? Have you heard of Emma Roy? No, she teaches me yoga. So. Okay. I've come from a slightly different direction. It might be a different, uh, yeah, a different tradition of yoga. There's, um, there's many sort, sorts of yoga. I teach a very um, traditional sort called Vini yoga, which is the style of Hatha, which basically, Hatha basically means moving your body about a bit. Um, the Vini yoga I teach is, is really uh, going right back to the ancient um, traditions and, and philosophies. Um, if you see some of these new kind of quite faddy ways of, of doing uh, physical yoga, um, they seem to lose that um, connection with the ancients, but also particularly, and what I think is a real loss, uh, how we breathe. Um, I'm not saying Emma Rowe does that. I've no idea who she is or how she teaches, but um, there's lots of different traditions and some are more ancient um, than others. Um, so um, yeah, uh, if you ever go to a yoga teacher, um, do ask them um, what their credentials are. Uh, rather than some people have been a yoga teacher because they've had a holiday in Spain and done their own yoga <laughs> practice for a couple of weeks and come back and call themselves a yoga teacher. So be very mindful of that. I, I've done four years of training and I'm, and that was uh, 20 years ago and I'm still training now. Before you came, Susie, we were talking about the uh, disadvantages of ageing and how increasingly frustrating it is and the body is not responding as we want. Have you got any comments? Yes, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yoga, there's always a yoga there no matter what age you are. And um, there's a, a kind of a traditional way of uh, an Indian style of life that would have had um, four, at least four different stages. So we start from the child stage and there's a very specific kind of yoga that would have been given to children. Um, but some of, many of the yoga postures we do now are only about 100 and 150 years old maybe. And children would have that right back in the early days would have been taught very complex and very um, specific postures and that were really tough. And when the body is you know, young and lithe and, and flexible and, and movable, and the postures have been you know, quick, 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 quick. So that style of, 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 of body work, of yoga, isn't um, suitable for most of us. So that's a, a, that's a, a type of yoga. Um, they would have been taught a, about the yoga. Maybe they would have repeated some ancient words that may not have had any meaning to them, but they would have learned the rhymes and the rhythms. Um, and later on in life, when they become a studier or a student, 
which is the next stage, then um, they would have learned uh, much more depth about the postures, about the uh, you know, other aspects of yoga in more detail and have a bit more of a deeper understanding about what these things do to the body, what they think these things do for the mind and what their potential is. Later on, we become householders. And when we become householders, we become in the world, having to do our duty, knowing that we've got maybe children to look after, we've also got older parents to look after, we've got jobs to hold down, we've got stuff to do. So there is, you know, uh, stuff going on in our bodies that we need to look after, but it might be just allowing ourselves to maintain where we are, not going downhill, but um, using our bodies and our minds and the way that we live in a way that maintains who we are and how we are in amongst all of that other um, responsibilities that we have. And that's a certain sort of yoga. And, you know, it might be for me personally, it might be 20 minutes a day, it might be 10 minutes, it might be an hour. Um, it might not be able to be done every day. It depends on our, our, you know, on, on, on what's going on in the world. But, but, you know, there's still some postural applications that are appropriate. Then we get to what's known as the sannyasin time. So we've moved beyond our um, middle-aged area. Um, and then we've, the children have moved home and maybe we're retired. Maybe the elderly parents aren't with us anymore and we're freer. And the bodies aren't you know, useful anymore and we, are, we aren't so able to get our leg over our ear. We are more concerned with what happens in our minds. So with all of the study that we've done, the body is free to be able to sit. And when we can sit comfortably, then the minds are... are have been going through all of that kind of education or study or personal reflection or spiritual reflection or traditional reflection or learning, whatever it might have been, then we can you move into our sannyasin time, our older years, to be able to maybe just, you know, a few postures to keep our joints lithe and our bodies working but the breath becomes much more important and the way we meditate becomes much more important. And we still have to work within this frame of the body, but we're comfortable with what we have. We have come to terms with it. And then the final objective of our life is to move what's known as a forest dweller. So when we become a forest dweller, we just let everything go and then we can move. This is a very ancient way of thinking about things, but hopefully it answers your question, Mary, that we move into another stage of life where we can just sit or lie and meditate. The body is free to just relax when the mind can relax and just move towards a personal objective of you know, a spiritual connection. This, this might sound a uh, simple thing on the face of it, but I believe it is a bit more complex than that. What is the relation of food and drink to the to the the the, the, the sort of practices that you have? Mm. Yes, uh, as you say, you rightly say, a very complex area. Um, so, if we're thinking about um, the Ayurvedic school of medicine. Ayurveda is the yoga school tool of medicine. And the Ayurvedic tradition, which is still used now in therapeutic uh, text, uh, context, um, is a way of the holistic being. So, and it includes the, the food and the drink intake that we have, and about how it can help us balance out our bodies and how it help, can help to either toxify us if we eat and take the wrong thing or make us feel detoxed to clear us out. So we can use our, um, what we imbibe in a, uh, we have to be quite mindful about, about it and make it appropriate. Again, a lifetime of, of study, and it's something that I'm not an expert in at all. 
But, you know, I do know that when I have, um, you know, I, maybe I've gone to a party and I've had a bit too much to drink, you know, I'm human too. Um, I don't do it often anymore, by, by the way. Um, uh, when I've, you know, just uh, eaten a full on Christmas dinner, I don't feel, you know, it's nice, but I don't feel great. I couldn't do my yoga. I couldn't move my body. I couldn't feel free in my body or my mind to be able to concentrate to be able to move, to be able to go for a long walk, to be able to, you know, use my mind in a way that was more um, clear or discerning because I'm too toxified by food and drink. Mm -hmm. So yoga, um, and if I can refer back to the Niyama, yoga um, reminds us that Salcha, which is the cleansing aspect of yoga, um, that involves the way we eat, the way we drink, um, and the amount that we eat and drink, and the kind of foods that we eat and drink that are appropriate to us, that might be, you know, my, my way of eating and drinking might be appropriate to me, but not necessarily to, to others. And um, yeah, Krishnamacharya, who is like the grandfather of this yoga, um, come, uh, about 150 years ago, he introduced it. And he used to say that um, uh, a good yogi diet it, um, is uh, a, a good way of um, cleansing the diet is not to eat three meals. <laughs> and a lot of people think that to cleanse our bodies, we need to starve or we need to fast. He used to write, I think rightly say that we just don't nibble, we just don't eat between meals, we eat, we fast, we have another meal later on, we fast, we have another meal later on. So it becomes a little bit more light, but you know, it's still appropriate to us. Hope, hopefully that helps a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I could help with anything spring to mind. It's, it's really interesting. I feel I know a lot more than I did an hour ago. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't know who said that, um, a couple of cameras are off, but but thank you. Yeah, as I say, if you want to come back to me with questions that come up later, um, you know, please feel free to contact me. Um, I'm usually available. I, I live in Portishead. Um, at the moment, I'm in the classroom in, in Clevedon. I'm teaching Clevedon as well. I've got a class in, in Bristol that I run sometimes. But uh, as I say, I do do one-to-one -one, um, for therapy, for counselling, for development in postures, body, mind, and um, to uh, make people feel better, hopefully. Would it, would it be in order for me to put your email address um, on the bottom of the presentation before it goes goes out. That'd be all right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely fine. Yeah. Okay. I'd be very happy to hear from any of you. Okay. So Ray, are, are you um, summing up and thanking? Is Ray there? Thing. That is the usual thing. Right. Well, thank you, Susie. That was, as I said earlier, an interesting and stimulating conversation, which uh, we come away with learning a lot more than we started with. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, to let you know that uh, this, this will go now onto the internet itself, you know, and, and others will view it. You know, the, the nine of us here in other times have had maybe uh, anything from two to 20, 30 people viewing it, but they're only able to view it on invitation rather than freely do this type of thing. So we don't have, you know, people who will, who will wish to troll us and other things, other nasty things like that. So uh, thank you for your time and your, 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 your effort. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Ray. And thank you for everyone for, for listening. Thanks, Susie. And thank you. today, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, even next Friday, we will be having, he says, oh. pregnant pause. 
Um, okay. Um, oh, I, sorry. I, 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 I haven't got it in front of me. If people that's are... Hold, that's, it. that's okay. Has anyone got it there in front of them? Anyone got the talk for next week? Don't know. No, okay. Yeah, give me a moment, please. The, um, there's uh, one rather amusing story which I think friends will be amused at uh, because uh, someone said about when the clerk came onto the stage, the recording clerk came on the stage, everything went silent. And I was at a uh, inter inter-religious meeting once where there are a great number of other religious faiths were there. And it was presented at yearly meeting. And as soon as Paul Parker, the, the recording clerk at the time, came onto the stage, the music, the, 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 everybody quiet, there was silence. And one other religious chap bent over to me and said, that's amazing. Could you, could you teach my, could you teach my congregation to do that? <laughs> Which I found quite highly amusing. I'm afraid I'm, I'll, I'll have to get you to tell me that one again, Ray, because I was concentrating like mad on trying to remember the title. Having found it, I then had to memorise it, and my memory is very poor these days. Um, it's going to be uh, our Jeffrey Smith. He's going to be talking about um, water supply, um, an explosion, and uh, I've forgotten it. Lord Chief Justice, does that ring a bell for anyone? Um, I think Harriet's got it. Um, <laughs> Is it, is it coming up on chat? I think it looks... No, it's not. No. Okay, it doesn't matter. It's okay. Uh, anyway, it, it will be a really interesting, well-prepared talk, I know, by, by Jeffrey. Um, and uh, he's very Sorry. eager to have um, a really large audience. So please, all feel free to join us next Friday. Jolly good show. Okay, okay. friends. Thank you very much, you all, for your time. And... As, uh, and have a very nice day. Thank you. Thank you, you, too. Thank bye you bye. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.